If you're new to our channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show today, it's about mistakes that people make when they dehydrate their food for preserving. And we have some great canning tips for you, and we have uh, guest author, blogger, Amy Strauss. Uh, she's a micro-urban farmer. All that plus your garden questions, and that starts right now. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. We're so happy that you have joined us. You can also find us on the Simple Radio app, the TuneIn app, and a variety of other platforms that we are not aware of, as well as the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. There's a number of ways. Oh, I'm your host, Joey Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner. Holly Baird, way, way to uh, forget me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a number of ways in which you can contact us. One is you can tweet us using hashtag TWVG. You can tw- uh, tweet us with our Twitter handle at TWVG Show. You can email us at TWVG at uh, TWVG Show at gmail.com. That's TWVG Show at gmail.com. Or you can call into the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn. Insects and rodents protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. The number you can call in at any time with your question or comment is 414-444-5250. And uh, you can do that uh, anytime during the show. Well, we're going to get into the program. And uh, when people preserve, and, and we've talked about this on the program several different times, there's a number of ways in which you can preserve your harvest. You can can. We'll talk about that in the second segment. You can just eat it as it is. You can freeze it. You and can even keep some things in the refrigerator for a while, too. You, you can ferment it yeah, as, ferment well. as well. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is dehydration of food this is a great way in which you can preserve it for literally years to a certain degree if it's kept in a proper uh, area environment Mm -hmm. Uh, the dehydration okay first of all let's talk about what we bring this up nesco is a sponsor of our garden talks you you've been with us at, at our library talks and other locations, Nesco, the dehydrating and slow cooking uh, company, uh, out of, uh, they, they sponsor the talk. So we're going to bring up the, they've got great dehydrators. And you can get any type of dehydrator. Uh, what is best to dehydrate your food with is a dehydrator that has a fan that pushes the air through the material. There are different dehydrators in which there's a heating coil at the bottom. And we're not asking you to go buy something from Nesco. I'm just explaining to you what the best unit, if you're going to go buy one, is. Uh, there's u- heating units or coils in the bottom of these units that the heat gradually raises, rises up with no force of fans whatsoever. I have found from personal experience those do not work very good at all. You want that force of warm or hot air blowing through the trays, through the food, to dehydrate it in an even fashion, in a timely fa- fashion. Uh, that's the best dehydrator that we have found that works. There's five mistakes that people make when dehydrating you know, you would think, oh, okay, I'm just going to take some tomatoes or peppers, whatever, throw in the dehydrator, and 12 hours later I'm going to have dehydrated peppers or sun-dried tomatoes. That's not really always the case. Right. So one thing you want to keep in mind is that you don't want to over or under dehydrate. So you kind of have to watch it. Um, there's lots of recipes online, all that information. They come you, with a guideline. And they do come with a guideline. And, yeah, and a temperature doing. gauge on most of these units between... 90 and 145, 160 degrees. And it says approximate for approximate time. This is not, you know, science. Based on food all has different water consistencies. And that's the biggest thing is that you don't want to under dehydrate because if you under dehydrate, then when you store it, it could possibly mold, it could just mushy, something like that. Right. It's not, it's still having that water consistency, that percentage of moisture that again will mold uh, and then you've not. You've wasted the time of energy. Right. So there's that. Um, and then over dehydrating, you're just going to... Turn into a leaf. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Like, it's not going to be tasty, I think, or it's going to be very brittle. There's like a 6 to 8% moisture con- content that you want in these. You want it to be, you know, not bone dry, leaf fall dry. You want it to have some consistency, a little moisture that holds on to the... the that's in the, the item. 
And the reason why we dehydrate, what is occurring, Holly, whenever we dehydrate, let's say, basil or thyme or tomatoes or peppers, what, what is really occurring? Sure. So what is What's going being on? removed and what well, is staying? The liquid of, or the, yeah, the moisture of the food or whatever is being removed and the, the main properties of that are staying. The flavors so are, the staying. Flavors are the staying. staying. The oils are staying. Right, the, the beneficial parts. So essentially when you dehydrate something, basil is a good example, or herbs, you're removing the moisture content, the water, but you're leaving the properties and the oils and the flavors, which actually intensifies the flavor of that particular item in which you're dehydrating. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that allows you to get, you know, tomatoes. We did sun-dried tomatoes. That's what we call them. That's what is called in the industry. But you put them in a dehydrator. Uh, and we find that it really eliminates almost totally the acidity that you're used to when you eat, an, uh, eat a red tomato. And they get really sweet. They're very sweet. It's almost like candy. It's, yeah. it's tomato candy is yeah. essentially what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, not everybody likes that flavor. Now, they work phenomenal if you're making noodles. Throw them in right at the end. They get a little soft, a little chewy, but they add that sweetness that you're not. It's a totally. It, I, I don't want to say it's a totally different property, but it's a it's a totally different taste. You you wouldn't expect that on a dehydrated tomato to have that type of uh, flavor. You're used to that acidity, that little bitterness. It's opposite when it comes to the dehydration of the tomatoes. Definitely. So yeah, over or under, big big difference. You got to pay attention. This is not a put in, walk away, come back type of thing. There's some finessing that you have to understand with a particular machine, the environment in which you are in, your house, the, the dryness or the, the dampness of the air. So that's one. And then um, you want to make sure you're, you're paying attention to, to the thickness. Um, and then the, so that's... Well, just like when you're doing any type of cooking, if the consistency is the same, it will all cook at the same rate. You don't have stuff overcooked or undercooked if you're cooking potatoes or whatever. Right. The, yeah. Yeah, so that's one. That's another one. Uh, the temperature. So again, it's going to come with a guideline, and but you can also find many resources online, books, um, all sorts of good information. But the temperature is key because if you dehydrate it at too high of a temperature, too low, depending on what it is, it might not dehydrate properly. Too fast, too slow. So that's why you want to make sure you're doing the right temperature. And people will ask us, can I take my seeds, my onion seeds, my bean seeds, my tomato seeds, and dehydrate them to get them to dry out so I can store them? The answer, the safe answer is no, because if you dehydrate your seeds, let's say you've got a whole bunch of bush bean seeds that you're trying to dry out to, to, to store. If you dehydrate them at too high of a temperature, you will destroy the germination inside of the seed, and then you have no, it's not good. Your best option when, when drying seeds, put it on a plate in an indirect area of, uh, in the corner where it doesn't get direct sunlight, let it dry naturally for two or three weeks. Then you know the properties and the germination is as good as it possibly can be, just like it would be drying on the vine out outdoors. Don't put it in a heat environment like a dehydrator. It's not going to be good. Right. So that's another one. Um, you want to taste test your recipe before dehydrating. I think that's important because, uh, for one, you're going to spend the time and energy to dehydrate. How do you do this? Like, if you're making a consistency like homemade fruit roll-up, you can taste that liquid. Yeah, or like some people make, I made dehydrator cookies once, so I tasted the recipe before. It was like a soaked oats type thing. You, people do that. They make like dehydrated crackers, things like that. So you want to make sure that when you taste it, it's not going to be too salty or too sweet or something like that. And like we talked uh, with... Um a couple of weeks ago, we're making small batch canning. Do a small batch dehydrating. You could, yeah, you could definitely do that. Or do several. If you have something that can go in at the same time, you can try smaller recipes. Right. These yeah. dehydrators, the Nesco, you, you start out with four trays. You can expand to 30 trays. That's a lot of material in which you are preserving. And if you go 30 trays of something and you find out later you don't really like that, you're throwing that away or you're having to find somebody to give it to. So do a small batch and then go from there. Then we also have, um, you want to make sure you're storing it properly. So, so what, what, yeah, okay, explain that. We, what is proper storage of a dehydrated item? Sure. So a lot of people um, will think, okay, I dehydrated all this. I can just put it in a, a zip-top bag and it'll be fine. And that's not the case because zip-top bags are not completely, um, I don't, they can kind of sit, get mushed down, things like that. 
Um, so there's no you, structure there's to no that. There's no structure to that. Right. So what you it, can it, do. Okay. So it's not so much that it will go bad in a Ziploc bag. It's the storage properties that you know crushed, and now you've got a bunch of crumbs. Or is that a little bit of both? Kind of both. Okay. Um, so then what you want to do is do something like glass jars. You can use, like, old mayonnaise jars or whatever, peanut butter jars, as long as they're glass. Glass, okay. And then where you could do, like, we do half-gallon mason jars. And um, these, these work great for ones that's got cracks, chips that you cannot safely can yeah. in. Yeah. yeah, so you could do, like, quart jars or whatever. And then you just want to make sure the lid is on tight. Some people will do, like, a vacuum seal on them as well. So it kind of is... is um, and, and you can do decorative jars or, or, you know, as long as that lid is sealed properly. Uh, now, there are some things in which, you know, we dehydrated last year for the very first time. We tried lettuce, leaf lettuce. That was weird. That was weird, but it, it, was, it was different, but it worked. Uh-huh. Um, Why did we do leaf lettuce? Well, I was going to see if we could, like, do it for uh, add a flavor to soups or stews or something. I just was experimenting on that procedure. Uh-huh. Leeks. Uh, people in the United States were tr- were trained to eat the lower bleached or white portion of the leek. Most any other country you go to, they eat the whole leek. The whole leek is edible. So the green portions, we chop up and dehydrate. You can also just put it right in your stir-fry soup, stew, whatever, or eat it just as is. Uh, tomatoes we talked about. We did cucumbers. And the yard-long cucumbers, which M.I. Gardener sells and we're growing, when dehydrating, they, they are very close to a melon taste consistency. They get 36 inches long. And when dehydrated, they almost taste like sweet candy that you would get from the fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very unique. We have dried, uh, dehydrated okra. Takes the greasiness out of the okra. Um, I still don't like it. You can also, with cucumbers, we've dehydrated just normal pickling cucumbers, yeah. and sprinkle a little dill weed on it. So you basically have a dehydrated pickle. Is kind it, of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it does taste good, though. And you can dehydrate the pick of the cucumbers and put it in water and infuse your water with... Uh, not Maybe not the dill ones. Not the dill ones, not the, the, the ones, plain ones. The plain ones. Yeah. yeah, unless you like dill water. So dehydrating is a great way. It's, an, it's a small investment to preserve a lot of food very easily. And then all you have to do is rehydrate. And you can do trail mixes. You can do uh, fruit roll-ups. You can do all of this stuff on a very cheap scale but on a more healthier level than what you would buy in the store. Well, when we come back, it's about Holly, and uh, she's going to go over uh, several canning tips that you're going to need in order to can the harvest. If you don't want to dehydrate and you're going to go can, what you can do to uh, to, to can your harvest safely so you don't have to worry about being sick from eating what you've canned right after this. Use Twitter to reach Joey and Holly at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG. The Tree Diaper is an advanced plant hydration system. It is an innovative device that captures and holds the water around your plants once full and hydrates them slowly when the plants need it over a period of 30 days. From half to 30 gallon capacity based on your needs. And easy to install even for a first time gardener. The Tree Diaper reduces weeds, protects plants, enhances root growth, and prevents overwatering. Whether you're growing trees, vegetables, flowers, house plants, in containers, or the ground, your plants will benefit greatly by allowing the Tree Diaper to do the work for you. Find out more at TreeDiaper.com. Made in the USA. The Handy Safety Knife is a patented, high-quality knife that's worn like a ring, so it's always conveniently at hand and very easy and efficient to work with. That's why you'll find the Handy Safety Knife at work in a wide range of industries and applications. Learn more at HandySafetyKnife.com. Place an order for your business Call toll-free, 866-294-3424. Use promo code WVG to get 10% off and free shipping one-time use only at HandySafetyKnife.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B-O-B-B. E-X-dot-C-O-M. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at rootassassinshovel.com. 
Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. Use coupon code WIVEG15 to save 15% off your next purchase at rebelgreen.com forward slash shop. The Zucchini. This garden fun fact is sponsored by ManureTea.com. Get your three-pack today. Drop the tea bag in water, let steep, and then feed your soil, not your plants. 100% organic. Find out more at ManureTea.com. Always free shipping. The Zucchini was first brought to the United States in the 1920s by the Italians. Zucchini has more potassium than a banana. Zucchini is the only fruit that starts with the letter Z. The flowers of the zucchini plant are edible. Fried squash blossoms are considered a delicacy. Flame Engineering, home of the weed dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses, find out more at flameengineering.com. Hostels wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Haas Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HaasTools.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin, Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show with your hosts Joey and Holly Baird. We talked about dehydrating in the earlier segment there, but we're going to talk about canning. It's kind of a, a preserving type of program today. Now, canning to some people is a very scary proposition, a very scary uh, uh, occupation, I guess, or, or job to do in the garden. And some people strictly don't can because they are scared, one, of improper canning, and they've heard stories of people being sick. Two, people don't want to can because on the pressure canning side, they are, they've heard these stories of pressure canning, canners exploding, and grandma told me this, that type of thing. And maybe they don't know anybody who's ever canned. Right. Like, I, that was me. I didn't know anybody who ever canned. I was like, I, that's not what city people do. Um, so, <laughs> and I obviously... And we found out with the guests that we've had on this program, it doesn't matter if you're 20 stories up or in right. the country, everybody, there's, the canning is for everybody. Right. So, um, there's, and when you go, when, when, uh, you come visit us, if you're able to at one of uh, Holly's basics of canning, we go over some of this material. Now, one of the, one of the things is canning safely. Right. And how do we do this? Sure. So what, uh, this is tips for successful canning and canning safely. Um, so what you want to do is you want to, first of all, you want to think, do I want to can that? You might see this cool recipe for like, I don't know, like we did pickled uh, Swiss chard stems. And you're like, well. We did it safely. We did it safely. But it tasted like it pickled was, celery. It was weird. Yeah, it was yeah. not a good. Um, but so like, or say you, you get this overabundance of whatever vegetable and you're like well i don't really like salsa but maybe i like my own salsa like it's it's really not going to be like yeah it might be tastier but it's not going to be any you don't different. like salsa doesn't matter what kind of salsa you make you're still not going to like salsa yeah, yeah exactly so you have to kind of think like is this something i want to have in my pantry that i'm going to eat at some point um we don't eat a lot of jam and jelly and at one point we canned a lot of jam and jelly luckily for us we gave it away um but that's something you you have to keep in mind so that's one thing. Also, is it safe to can? What process am I using? How am I canning this? So um, 
things like if you're going to water bath can, which is a very typical ease into canning way, if you can any vegetables that are low acid, you have to either pickle them, typically pickle them, add an acid to, to the canning brine, or if it's something like fruit, you have to add sugar, sometimes salt, it just depends. So you have to be smart about how you're Which canning. if you're going to can and you're going to start off with, don't worry about pressure canning them. Don't even think about that. Stick with the water right. bath. Understand the basic science and the properties and all that goes on with that. And then your pr your pressure canning becomes much easier once you understand that. Right. And I'm going to say that I, even though I started canning, um, I don't know, probably like, what, Two, eight years ago? 2010, yeah. 11, yeah. So, I, and I learned a lot from Joey, and I read a lot of books, and I looked at stuff online. I also took a class, or a couple classes, through the Milwaukee Recreation Department, and I would highly rec recommend... Um, doing that with, because with Milwaukee County Master Canner Christina, Christina Ward, Ward she's been yeah. on the program. So um, that's a great resource. Those classes are very uh, cheap, and you get to take home and what you, get you to make. Take home what you what you can. And, and she doesn't let you do it wrong. No, no, she's definitely a really good instructor. So you learn a lot there too. Um, I also took a, a fermentation class as well. So there's a lot of different classes that you can take there. So that's one thing. Um, you want to keep it clean. You want to be safe. So. If you use a chopping board for raw chicken, even if you've cleaned it or whatever, you don't want to use that for your canned vegetables or fruits. If you're going to do a lot of canning, designate specific pieces of equipment strictly for the canning procedure across uh, for years. Don't worry. Don't use that for any other application in the kitchen right. besides the canning. Yes. Um, so that's that's another one. Also, even like things like um, soups or uh, uh, spoons, ladles, spatulas. spatulas, like spoons and ladles, you want to make sure those are not metal. So you can use plastic or wood, but not metal because they can have a reactive effect. And when you're doing this canning procedure, number one, if you've never done it before, and you can ask online if you don't know anybody who does can, sit in or, or have them come over and help them. Not like do it for you, but have them help you because that makes a tremendous difference when you have a, a, a well-veteran canner behind you going, okay, this is how you do it, and this is why you do it. Uh, if you don't know anybody in your church or your, your gatherings or whatever, ask online. Somebody will most likely be able to come and, and help you with that. Uh, again, when you're doing your canning in your kitchen, small children, pets, animals, all that, make sure they're out. Now, young, ch I mean, I'm, I'm talking young children, like little infants, you know, that two, three, four. If there's 10, 11, that type of thing, you have to be your own discretion on that. If they're able to help and they want to learn, that's fine, but pets and all that they, they need to be out of like the, you probably shouldn't have your one-year-old crawling around on the kitchen floor while you do this um because first of all you could possibly trip on that child or um you're dealing with very hot, hot things, things. Yeah. yeah you need to you know scald your, your uh, but, little one but yeah so definitely keep that in mind um read the recipe do you have the ingredients on hand do you have enough time sometimes you get these recipes and it's like soak this for three hours or 24 hours um and you you get home from work at 7 o'clock, and that would push you at 10 o'clock before the canning procedure even begins. So you want to be aware of that, as well as if your recipe, what is the what is the standard now? If the recipe is how old, you don't want to use it? I would say at this point now, about 10, 10 years old. If it's over 10 years old, then you don't want to use it. Um, it's It might be not be safe. If you're not sure, you can always reach out to the National uh, Center for Home Food Preservation, your UW, UW Extension, etc., things like that so and then it, what what resources can we find that we know are reliable safe sources we just don't want to go to you know google how to do this and just pull up the for, for, full first recipe we see there needs to be some credibility behind that recipe that it just wasn't and whoever from baltimore maryland that made this up 25 years ago and it worked for her right so there's some good there's some good websites one is the ball canning website which is freshpreserving.com uh, anything that comes out from better homes and gardens that's good um, taste of home they have good canning recipes and then sb canning so she's from santa barbara sb canning she's a master canner out there she's got great recipes and the national center for home food preservation all of those are safe resources. Oh, and um, Melissa, Marissa McClellan that we had on the show, she's she's from Food Food in Jars. She's great, too. If you just search and you're in the Milwaukee area, search Master Canner of Milwaukee County, she will come up as that. So use the, use the right equipment, on, get the right equipment, make sure you have the right equipment on hand. 
And with anything cooking, preserving, the fresher you can get, the better it's going to be. If you're, you know, if you don't want to harvest cucumbers on Monday and then decide to pickle them on Sunday afternoon, they're going to lose a lot of flavor, a lot of structure to them because they begin to break down after you harvest them. That's how organic and, and produce and nature works. As soon as something is harvested or dies, it begins to turn we back get, into We get soil. a lot of questions about mushy pickles, and one thing I have to say is that one is that as soon as you as soon as you harvest them, you do want to can them. So if you're like, um, I just want to do a small batch real quick, then do a small batch real quick. Another thing is to work quickly. Do not let those sit in that brine for a long time. Make sure you pickle Make the sure right you... kind of pickles or cucumbers. That too. There's yeah. pickling cucumbers and slicing cucumbers. Don't intermix the other because but, they do turn right. Smushy. Definitely, you just want to work quickly, and you if you are really that bothered by cucumbers being too mushy. Then do like a refrigerator method. Or do a small, instead of quartz, do pints because they're in the heat less and they become opportunity of less uh, soft and more crunchy. Definitely. And finally, don't overwhelm yourself. Let's start small. Just like gardening, don't decide you're going to do 300 jars and then 25 jars into your season. You're like, I'm done, not going to do this anymore. Be smart about it. Understand how much you feel you can actually handle with the time that you have available and then do it that and then gradually work yourself up. Uh, to a point where two years ago we did 320 jars. Last year our, our harvest was not that great, and we didn't do nearly that many. But um, know what you're capable of doing. Well, when we come back, Amy Strauss, author, blogger from Ohio, will be with us talking about micro-urban farming right after this. <laughs> 24-7-365, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com has all the gardening information you need, videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. I know you're looking for an alternative to harsh chemicals, but you want professional strength products. BioSafe's Garden Line gives you just that. Professionally used for 20 years, available to homeowners. Organic solutions that are effective. They offer an array of eco-friendly products from plant food, fertilizer, to one-of-a-kind herbicides, organic weed killer. BioSafe's products can be used around children, pets, wildlife, so you can enjoy your yard more. Grow stronger, healthier with BioSafe. Find us on Facebook at BioSafe home and garden and visit us at biosafe.net to learn more get 10 percent off your next purchase at biosafe.net by using coupon code twvg at checkout Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy, homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Purple Cow Organics quickly and naturally increases the uptake of nutrients and water to your plants with their new bioactive vegetable supercharger designed to meet the unique needs by helping the living organisms in the soil help plants uptake the nutrients more quickly through their roots and leaves. Find out more at purplecoworganics.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at thegardenershollowleg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at ZazProducts.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccessOrganics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. PlantSuccessOrganics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccessOrganics.com. 
MyGardenSeeds.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at MIGardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round. Pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to MIGardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife. BioSafe. Tall Earth. Chapin International. The Plant Booster. Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It's midsummer, but it's still opportunities to get your landscape the way you want it and bulk material is probably the best option whether it's wood chips or if you're topping off raised beds or grow areas blue Mel's landscape and garden center has that but when you go and get those materials they have 40 different varieties in which you can choose from you can stop into the coffee shop there as well and get you a beverage before you get tackling your job and any advice you need they will certainly give you the correct answer, not the answer that you want to hear. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center is the place for all of that and more. They are at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just south of Layton. And you can call them at 414-282-4220 or visit them online at bluemills.com. They will uh, surpass all of your expectations. Uh, if we want to go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline, Holly, and bring in our next guest. Amy Strauss is an author and blogger living in Ohio. She's an urban homesteader, student, and home economist. She writes all about micro farming, modern homesteading, and more. Welcome to the program, Amy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, um, you are a small urban farmer or a micro farmer. How did you get into that? Uh, yeah, you know, it happened quite by accident, actually. Uh, over 10 years ago, I was a high school teacher. I found my job to be fairly stressful, um, as anyone can imagine, working with teenagers. And I was also experiencing some health issues that, um, you know, a lot of pain that I was dealing with. I was looking for something therapeutic, a sort of hobby that I could jump into. And um, I decided to take on gardening. I had never gardened before. I kind of... uh, think of it as my dirt therapy, you know, having my hands in the dirt, uh, you know, having the sun on my skin, uh, tinkering with plants. I found it to be so therapeutic, actually, that I kind of dove in um, kind of in a geeky way. I started studying soil science. I became uh, certified in permaculture, which is designing agricultural landscapes that work with nature. And I started taking on garden clients, garden design clients in my community. And I even started a community garden. And so all of this tinkering that I was doing in my yard and in my community actually sort of uh, morphed into this second career for me because I found it so rewarding and contagious. So I started sharing um, what I was learning through my experiences on my website, 10 Great. Um, and Amy, we uh, appreciate you uh, calling in. Um, but it sounds like you might be on speakerphone. There's a lot of echoey feedback, possibly. Or if you're on a Bluetooth device, I'm not really sure. Um, but if you are on speakerphone, um, if you could take us off, that'd be helpful. Um, so. Uh, you, you grow in a very small area, area. And tell us about your homestead. It's a tenth of an acre, which people may not be familiar with the size of that, but you produce a lot in that very small area. Uh, Yeah, actually. um, Yes, the original 10th acre farm uh, was very small, one-tenth of an acre, so that's how my website got its name. And, yeah, we were just growing on a small suburban plot in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. Um, We did have a lot of challenges that regular gardeners uh, experience. Um, you know, dealing with small spaces, uh, poor soil, sloping land, 
And, you know, it was a challenge, even the shade. Those were all challenges that I was dealing with in my yard that I think a lot of, you know, residential growers have to deal with. But, you know, one of my biggest challenges was uh, growing in my front yard because that's where I had the most sun and the most open area to grow in. So figuring out how to grow um, in the front yard so that I still had a good relationship with my neighbors, um, managing water properly, uh, making it very aesthetically pleasing, and um, also being very productive. You know, that was a big challenge for me. Um, so those were all the things that I was experiencing. The front yard ended up being a, a very integrated permaculture landscape with a lot of um, perennial fruits growing. I had currants, black raspberries, cherries, strawberries growing up there. And, um, you know, all of these experiences actually I'm excited to take into my next uh, experience, which now I'm living on three acres. We recently moved. Uh, but all of these things that I learned will be, um, you know, applicable here as well because most of our three acres is wooded. So I'm still growing in a very similar sized area. Well, whenever you were growing in the front yard there, was there any restrictions based on the city ordinances and where you lived that prohibited you from doing certain things that you wanted to do, or was you able to work around those restrictions by incorporating things where other people may not notice them? Uh, there weren't any specific restrictions that I was working with. Um, I know that a lot of people deal with that if they live in an HOA or some something like that. Uh, but what one of the things that I was doing because I love you know the science of it all and experimenting and and um, figuring out what works. Uh, you know that's all part of what uh, you know makes me come alive. And so when I was experimenting in my front yard, I wanted to find strategies that would be applicable for anyone, even if you were living with, you know, restrictions about what you can grow. Uh, the landscape ended up being very beautiful, and um, nobody would know that it was, you know, an edible landscape um, unless they were familiar with those types of plants. Oh, and then now do you, since you've moved to the three acres, do you have animals now, or is that something that you're wanting to, per uh, to incorporate, like chickens with, for eggs and that type of thing? Uh, you know, actually, when you speak about restrictions, that's actually one restriction that we have here. We're still in the suburbs, and so we're not zoned agricultural, and we actually are not allowed to uh, keep livestock here. Okay. Um, so... You, you, you know, you consider yourself a modern homesteader. Many people think of homestead as livestock, green stock, and more. Obviously, you can't have the agricultural aspect with the livestock. What makes somebody a modern homesteader, would you say? You know, I think this idea of being a homesteader is kind of rooted in this idea of, you know, pro providing some of our own needs and uh, being more self-sufficient. And so I think that we can carry that spirit into uh, our modern ways of living, regardless of, you know, the old, um, the traditional way of homesteading is to have a more rural landscape where you've got a lot more land and you can really be, you know, work toward full self-sufficiently self-sufficiency, but I feel like we can do that in the suburbs and in our urban spaces, and I, I've been seeing a very, um, a, a big comeback in this area in recent years. I think people really want to have some, you know, grounding in their local environment. They want to have a connection with the spaces um, in which they live. Um, it's kind of a response to this hyper-technological um, world that we're now living with, um, when we can go into our backyards and have, you know, a relationship with that space and grow some of our own food and feel connected to it, uh, I think that it, um, you know, of course, in my case, I can say for sure, it becomes this um, therapeutic experience, but also very re rewarding when you can meet some of your own needs, uh, no matter, you know, the size of your space or what you're dealing with. I've even heard of, you know, uh, apartment dwellers who consider themselves homesteaders because, you know, they're focusing on uh, uh, finding, uh, sourcing local, um, you know, food and then 
you know, preserving that harvest for the winter. And they're doing that for themselves as a response to, you know, this consumer-based lifestyle. So I think we can have homesteading um, in this modern sense, regardless of what our living conditions are. Well, you manage what is called a CSA. For people who are unfamiliar with what a CSA is, what is that? And how can people anywhere in the world or in the United States find out where they may have a CSA at and, and be part of it? I guess I have managed a CSA in the past. Um, when I first started over 10 years ago, I got involved in a CSA as a participant. And CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And in this uh, type of setup, you have a, um, a relationship with a local farmer. Uh, it's a subscription-based model. So at the beginning of the growing season, you would pay an annual fee. And um, this is sort of an investment into your local farmers. And it helps them buy seeds and equipment and materials to get the season going. And, um, and then in return, you get a weekly share of produce. Usually, it's a CSA modeled in produce, um, fruits and vegetables, but I've also seen CSAs that are um, selling uh, meat products or dairy products. So the CSA model can be uh, you know, applied to any agricultural situation. But when I was involved in the CSA, um, first as a participant, I found it to be incredibly rewarding, so I joined the uh, management team there. And it was uh, incredible to see what goes into feeding 100 families. That's, uh, you know, the um, administration behind that and the hard work of the farmers to coordinate it all and make it happen when every year you're dealing with different, you know, temperatures changes, uh, rainfall changes, and different weather conditions that are beyond your control. And still, you have to figure out how to eke out, <laughs> you know, this uh, produce for the number of shares you have. It's an incredible experience. And what I find is that the CSA program helps us learn how to use and preserve, um, you know, the food that's coming in throughout the garden season. So when you go to be a gardener yourself, you'll the CSA is kind of a stepping stone that helps you get um, – connected with that side of things, um, what to do after you've harvested things. And I think CSAs are pretty easy to find. Um, there are some websites out there, but, you know, the easiest way is just to Google, you know, CSA and then, you know, the name of your community. So I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I would just Google uh, CSA Cincinnati, Ohio to see what comes up. But it, a lot of those CSAs are popping up, um, especially surrounding um, metropolitan areas. Great. Now, what are some tips for starting a garden on a small budget? Uh, you know, I think we can use tips for starting a garden no matter if we have a big budget or a small budget. My answer would be the same because I think, um, you know, as gardeners, we're so excited to get started um, when we think about having a garden. So that my first suggestion is to start slow and to start small. Uh, when you start with a small garden, you can always work up. You can always increase your garden space over time as you learn to manage it. What we don't want is for you to start out as a beginning gardener um, with a very large space to garden and you quickly become overwhelmed, and we don't want it to become something that's not enjoyable. We don't want it to become a source of stress. We want it to be, uh, you know, a rewarding experience. So when we start up, or start small, learn a garden in a small space, then we can work our way up to bigger spaces. Uh, my other suggestion is to um, be a collector of uh, organic matter. So whether that means becoming, um, you know, starting a compost bin of your own. Uh, worm composting bins are an excellent way to um, compost your food scraps. Uh, whether that's calling a local tree company and starting to get um, free deliveries of wood chips or whether that's going around in the fall and collecting leaf bags from your neighbors who are setting their leaf bags out um, as waste. Collecting all of this organic matter 
is going to uh, really be helpful when you go to start gardens because as gardeners, we never have enough organic material and it's going to help us uh, build healthy soil and prevent pests from the get-go. Absolutely. Well, Amy, we greatly appreciate you coming on the program. How can people find out more information about you and follow your journey? Uh, you know, people can find me on my website, 10 And um, I, I have a special uh, gift for subscribers of my newsletter, which is my Guide to Organic Soil Amendments. And, you know, what I was just mentioning about collecting organic material and how helpful it is and important it is for building healthy soil, it's also very important to choose the right organic amendments for your particular situation. So the free guide that I have for newsletter subscribers will, will help people um, choose the right amendments for that, their situation. Uh, also, my book, The Suburban Micro Farm, it really gets into the challenges and barriers of residential gardeners, uh, especially uh, dealing with you know poor soil and shade and sloping land. I get into permaculture a lot in the book. So I encourage people to check that out. Uh, it's called The Suburban Micro Farm, and it can be found at thesuburbanmicrofarm.com. And you can find me on social media, actually. Um, I'm Tenth Acre Farm. You can find me at, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, Amy, we thank you very much for coming on, sharing your knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, Absolutely. Amy. And when we come back, your garden questions, our garden answers, right after this. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVorganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Do you enjoy hanging baskets but struggle to keep them properly watered? The Plant Booster Self-Watering System is a mechanical system that will ensure optimal soil moisture at all times by reacting to the weight of each plant. The weight of each plant tells the system how much water it needs. Unlike a timer control system where all plants get water at the same time, whether they need it or not. Also ideal for condos or apartments with no outdoor water source. Check out details, videos, and extensive explanation and ideas for application at plantbooster.net. I know you're looking for natural and organic food, but at a great price. I found the place. Woodman's has what you need. Woodman's offers a huge natural and organic selection with some of the area's largest organic meats, produce, and dairy departments. Shop consciously, but it won't break the bank. They have aisles of all the organic food, snacks, and treats you've been looking for so you and your family can eat healthier without overpaying. Visit their Milwaukee area store locations, Kenosha, Menominee Falls, Oak Creek, and Waukesha, or visit woodmans-food.com to find the nearest location to you. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice a health food store's hundreds of products vitamin supplements bath and body items magazines cards books and a knowledgeable staff catering available open daily at 8 a.m the restaurant serves breakfast lunch and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good healthy homemade food including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties 1901 east north avenue milwaukee 414-278-7878 and online at beansandbarley.com Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique Silver Age wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunks. Find out more at TallEarth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at TallEarth.com. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear and all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. It's that time to get your lawn lush and green with the Chapin Spreader, the broadcast spreader that outperforms all in their class. Get consistent results year after year as if you'd hired your own professional lawn service. Find Chapin Spreaders online or order through your local Home Depot, Lowe's, True Value, or Do It Best Hardware stores. To see the full line of Chapin lawn and garden products, go to www.chapinmfg.com. This season, arm yourself with the better spreader, Chapin. 
Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seating Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oil, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Holly Baird. You can certainly give us a ring, jam your fingers and phones. If you've got a question about gardening, you can do that for the IV Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Yeah, you can call 414-444-5250. Um, IV Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damage and sunburn. Insects and rodents protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. That's 414-444-5250. Pat emailed us, and you can do that. You can send us an email. You can send us a tweet, uh, twbgshow at gmail.com. We've got uh, different questions came in on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, email. Pat emailed us and said, I have a p- question here about pole beans. Uh, this is the first time I'm planting them, and they're getting really tall but have very few white blossoms on it. Uh, uh, and they're not developing yet. Somebody told me you should cut the tops off. Please help. Well, you don't want to cut the tops off or the growth tips off of your pole beans. The reason for that is if you decide to cut the tops or the growth tips off, you're not going to put, it's not going to develop more beans on the plant. What's going to occur is the plant's going to get bushier, put more leaves on it because it's getting stressed from the top, and it's not going to put, so you're going to have much more lush plant, but not very many beans. Pole beans take 70 to 80 days to reach maturity. Then they begin to develop their, their fruit, and they'll produce all the way till frost. So the best thing to do is be patient, wait until the fruit begins to, or the beans begin to develop, and then harvest them regularly. If you continue to harvest them regularly, then the plant will continue to produce. If you leave them alone and they get large and mature, the plant will shut down and die because the reproductive cycle is already complete. So keep that in mind. Uh, Another question here came in, or more of a comment, in regards to basics of making tomato, uh, whole canned tomatoes. Uh, I recently, uh, I really appreciate, Holly, that you show your mistakes and what can happen in the canning process. Um, so what had happened was is that we did a video on making, on canning whole tomatoes, and we made a mistake. We didn't make the jars hot before we put the, the hot tomatoes in there, and then before we put the hot stuff into the hot water. And so what happened is that cool jar between the combination of the hot tomatoes in the jar and then putting it into the hot water, it basically cracked the bottom of the jars. Joy and I were, we put one jar and we heard this like uh, poppy noise almost. And we're like, that's weird. What's that? I don't know. So then we put another one in and then we realized that we were breaking jars. So definitely uh, we make mistakes too. And the conclusion of that comment was, um, it really helps when starting out. I've had a lot of success with your awesome recipes, which Holly, you've gotten from Reliable Sources Ball, National Home for Food Preservation, uh, SB Canning, uh, especially your apple butter pear uh, butter, etc. Your jams, uh, you are an angel. So that's uh, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it's very nice. Uh, so uh, you can uh, follow all of those. Uh, just go to the website and specifically type in in the search bar. Uh, what you want to look for on your basics or uh, uh, canning what you grow, and there's 45 different recipes that you can pick from. Uh, real quick here, my uh, plants are doing terrific in my straw bale garden, but uh, they are collapsing as they decompose, and there's an orangey powdery substance. Uh, what is it? Well, so that's it's called, called dog vomit fungus. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just it happens on organic mulch as well. Okay. So. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so that's one thing. We looked it up, and if you have 
if you if you have that issue, definitely look it up and see and see if the pictures compare to what you. It's have. not. It's not bad. No. It's but you just don't want to just leave it alone. It'll it'll it. go away on yeah. its own. Yeah. Fire blight on my apple tree. Can you help me with that? Well, first of all, uh, fire blight is a disease that affects apples and pears and some other members of that family. It's a serious disease that uh, pear and apple producers are concerned with because it can eradicate an entire orchard over a growing season. There is some ways in which you can um, control it. You want to select a variety that's resistant to that if you can. Avoid heavy pruning and over-fertilization in the nitrogen uh, levels as this would increase growth if you're in an area where it's more susceptible. Avoid uh, planting uh, close to wild plants of the hearthorn of our apple or pear. As soon as fire blight is discovered, you can prune off the infected branches one foot below the diseased section and then burn those to prevent any further infection. You want to dip your cutters, your pruners, in a 10% uh, mixture of alcohol and bleach between each cut so you don't infect new cutting areas. Early application of liquid copper fungicide is effective uh, in, uh, against this problem. You want to follow the recommended mixture rates on that. Uh, there uh, are other different applications in which you can get this, uh, but if you think you've got some problems with your plants, look up fire blight and see if the images match what the problems you're having are and then follow the recommended rates uh, and, and advice that you're finding uh, to Get rid of the infected parts of the particular tree. Uh, in regards to your how to make kabucha uh, segment a couple of weeks ago, I deal with, I make a lot of kabucha and I have a lot of scoby. I have f- read that you can dehydrate it in a food dehydrator and give it to your dog as a treat. Is this true? Yes, it is. You can dehydrate it and, and they enjoy it. Uh, very much so. You can, if you have animals, uh, chickens, goats, pigs, that type of thing, they'll eat it. It's got a high level of vitamin B. You can also bury it in your garden or your compost pile, and it will do the same thing. Uh, you can also divide it, which is what we would recommend if you can uh, encourage your friends and family to brew their own kabucha. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Create a, the, the scoby yourself and then, uh, or buy one, and go that route. Now, not everybody likes kabucha, uh, so you want to make it and see if they like it first, and then you can encourage them to brew their own. I've taken it to some friends, and they were not at all fond of the taste. I guess it's an acquired taste. There's a lot of great health benefits to kabucha, and if you don't like to make it, maybe you can find a flavor at the store that you do like, and you can get the benefits there. We are out of time, and we certainly appreciate your time, you being part of the program, allowing us to take a little bit of your Saturday morning to uh, inspire you and inform you of some garden techniques that may be beneficial to you in your particular growing situation. Join us next week, programming note. We're going to discuss, and we want to hear from you, why do you garden? Who influenced you? Was it an aunt? Was it an uncle? Did you see it on TV? Or was it a choice that you made that was best for your family? We want to hear your stories. As well as, what is the mid-lighter gardening method? It's a technique that some people are not familiar with, and it's not always for everybody. We'll go over the details on that. As well as our guest, Lisa Davis, MPH. She is the host of NPR's It's Your Health. She's also an author. She'll be with us to talk about healthy living uh, and healthy eating. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can certainly find that at the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, under the radio tab. And if you want a specific interview or individual highlight uh, segment, you can find that under the Highlight tab on the right-hand side of the main page. And we're on many platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic, Google Play, uh, TuneIn, and a variety of other ones. Well, until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You've been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Tell a friend and join Joey and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. 
The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcast, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communication Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.